No matter who you are, you will have haters. John 15 verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated Jesus first. So if you have haters, know that God is greater than your haters. Lately you've been feeling, feeling the way of your haters coming at you with their envy and their hate. Scheming against you, throwing mud on your name. But God's gonna work it out despite their lies and game. God is greater, so much greater than your haters. God is greater, don't give up, it'll pay off later. God is greater, through the pain you're a giant slayer. Let the haters hate while you Your goals keep rising, keep shining. Your haters can't stop no show. They can hate all they want to. Remember, you are blessed. Never let a hater see you sweat. Cause this is just a test. God is greater, so much greater than your haters. God is greater. Don't give up. with grace one day at a time they can laugh and they can mock you but you won't miss a beat when people don't receive you shake the dust off your feet god is greater so much greater than your haters god is greater don't give up it'll pay off later god is greater through the pain you're a giant slave Welcome. Today we're talking about friends who never show up for you. If you are that friend, you're the diehard tried and true friend who shows up for your other friend's special occasions and their moments in need, but you really don't have anyone who rejoices when you rejoice and mourns when you mourn, then you absolutely know what I'm talking about when you were the go-to person, but you find that you don't have anyone that you can go to and there's people that call themselves your friend. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share if you find value here. Before we get into today's topic, I want to tell you about the inspirational mug that I'm drinking out of, and it is the No Weapon Formed Against Me Shall Prosper mug. Sometimes we got to remind ourselves that even though weapons are forming, they won't prosper. If you have any of our mental health merch, any of our inspirational mugs, hoodies, t-shirts, or any of my books, which one do you have and how has it blessed your life? let us know in the comments section so friends who never show up for you how do you deal with that one of the most painful realizations that you will come to is when you begin to really think through the dynamics and the interactions of your friendships and maybe you're part of a friend group and you find that they hang out and the way that you find out is you see the pictures on Instagram, you see the pictures on Facebook, and you're thinking to yourself, where was my invite? How come, you know, I didn't know about it? And you may say to yourself, okay, once I could say you forgot, but this is a habit. Like I'm hardly ever invited, yet you could pick up the phone when you need money or when you need a ride or when you need a favor or when you need a listening ear. And so you really begin to realize that uh, you are that friend who is there for your friend's celebratory moments. You were at the baby shower. You were at the bridal shower. You were at the birthday dinners. But on your birthday, you don't even get a happy birthday text. 
on uh, your special occasions, no one is celebrating with you. You were there when your friend was in the hospital or they got a flat tire. You know, they called you and you were right there. But you can't even get someone to bring you a sandwich if you got the flu. So that can really begin to take a toll. So what do you do when you find that you were in that situation? And I want to give you some scriptures and I want to give you some things to think about. It is your life and you got to do what's best for you. But here are some options that you may want to consider if you are that friend who has friends who never show up for you. Number one, evaluate whether or not you've placed that so-called friend or friend group in the wrong social category. This is what I mean by that. So often we use the word friend too loosely. And we call everybody who we're cool with, who we get along with, who we've known for a long time a friend, when in fact they may not be demonstrating friendship-like qualities. Friendship, friendship is based on care, kindness, consideration, courtesy, loyalty, trust. There are some very specific qualities that you are looking for in a friend. And so a lot of times we use the word, oh, this is my friend, because we work together and we get along or we live in the same neighborhood. This is my friend, when in reality, that's your neighbor uh, or the person that you're working with, that's your coworker, but you get along well. And so we, lo we, we, we use that word very loosely without really taking the time to think through, is this really a friend? When I look at how this person treats me, when I look at the dynamics of our relationship, when I look at our interactions, is this a friend? And if you find that the only time they're reaching out to you is when they need money, a ride, a favor, a listening ear, or they need something from you, but it is crickets when you reach out, then that's telling you that there is an imbalance with respect to that friendship. And so there are a couple of categories that you may want to think about as you are evaluating the people whom you call friend. So you have your tried and true friends, right? And those are the people who rejoice when you rejoice, mourn when you mourn, celebrate your achievements and accomplishments as you do the same for them because friendships are reciprocal, not transactional, but they are reciprocal. And I'm going to give you a scripture that will show you that. So is this a tried and true friend, someone you can trust, somebody that, you know, when, you, when they get upset with you, they don't tell all your secrets. They are there for you. They stand by you. When your name comes up in rooms, they defend your name. If somebody is talking bad about you, they take it personal. Like, hey, it's like you're talking bad about me. Like, that's my friend. So it's very hard to find a friend like that. So when you find a friend who's a tried and true friend, that is a treasure. That is like an oak tree. And you really want to value that friendship. And so that is a friend. Then you have the friendship who is... Uh, like a sister or a brother. And so even more than the tried and true friend, this is even deeper. This is the person who goes beyond friend and they're like family. They are like family. You consider this person your sister, your brother. You have your ups and downs like any relationship. You know, you're not going to agree on everything because we have individual minds and we all have our own beliefs. But there is a level of love. There's a level of care. You know they love you and you love them. You know they care about your well-being and you care about their well-being. And even if you haven't spoken in months, right, as life gets busy, maybe you live in different cities, maybe they move to a different part of the world so you can't see each other like you used to. Uh, maybe they have children, they're married with children, and so they have different responsibilities. But you know that you can call on them and they are there for you and vice versa. And this is like a family relationship. No questions asked, they're there. Again, that's like an oak tree that is very rare to find. If you find one person like that, that is very rare to find. Then you have your acquaintances and here's where it gets tricky because most of the people who we call friends are acquaintances, even if you've known them for decades even if you've known them since the sandbox in the schoolyard. And so sometimes they were just long-term acquaintances, meaning we grew up in the same neighborhood. We see each other every day because we went to the same school. Uh, we, maybe we were in college together. We took many of the same classes, had the same professors study together. 
But do you see tried and true friendship qualities, loyalty, trust, respect, care, consideration? And so sometimes we're saying this is my friend when in reality it's a 20 year acquaintance. When in reality it's an acquaintance who you know from the neighborhood. When in reality it is an acquaintance who you know from, from church. And so you may meet some women in church or you may meet some men in church and you may uh, maybe go out to eat afterwards or whatever you uh, do after church. Maybe you call one another and pray together. But when you're really in a jam, when you're really in a jam, you might not be able to count on them. And the only way you're going to know that, right, is through time, right? The Bible says, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit to see whether they are from God. And so you have to test the spirit for friendship. You have to test to see if that is there. And you're going to know that by seeing how do they handle, how do they handle you? And how do you handle them? Because sometimes we want qualities that we ourselves don't give. And so we have to be mindful of that. So if you're not giving care, consideration, trust, loyalty, someone can tell you their secret, you're going to take that to the grave. You're not going to weaponize their vulnerability. If you are giving those qualities, you can honestly say so. And you are uh, friends with someone who does not give those qualities. And that is not your friend. That's not a friendship match, even if they consider themselves your friend. So you really have to think through this. And it's your life, right? You got to do what works for you. The next category is coworkers. And so you can have coworkers that you've worked at the same job and you get along well, you laugh, you have jokes, you get a bite to eat. But the relationship is centered around the workplace. Now, sometimes you do find that you will make a friend at the workplace. I have someone who we worked together more than, more than 20 years ago. That's how long ago it was. And we are friends to this day, right? But you got to know that everybody you work with is not your friend and you don't go to the job to make friends. But you can have a friendship blossom from uh, the workplace that does happen. But you got you still have to be mindful. That's rare. So a lot of people are going to fall into the co-worker category and you just have a solid relationship with this person. But it is a co-working relationship. So you can count on them to come through as it relates to things that you're doing at work. If you needed a ride to work, you could carpool with one another. And you are co-workers who get along well, but when the stuff hits the fan outside of work, uh, you're, you're really going through something, they may not be there for you. And it doesn't necessarily make them a bad person. It means that you have placed them in the wrong category. You are assigning the word friend to someone who is a co-worker that you get along really well with. And even if you use the term friend, right? Because sometimes we'll say, oh, this is my friend Bob. This is my friend Sally. In your mind, you need to be clear of the category that they would fall on, fall in, I'm sorry, based on the dynamics of your relationship, based on your experiences with them, because you know them, I don't. You've had personal experience with them, based on their character towards you, based on their track record. These things matter. And then the last category is an associate. And so associates are people who you associate with based on a specific purpose. So maybe you're part of a knitting group. You're part of a hiking group. You can insert an activity that you do. And as a result of that common activity, you come together and maybe you get along, you have laughs, you have jokes, right? And a friendship can blossom from these things, but it doesn't automatically mean that you are friends. And so friendship has to be tested. It has to be tried and true. And so initially you are associates, even in a church setting, when you are going to a new church and you meet a group of women or a group of men and you seem to get along well, they seem nice enough, right? You don't really know their character. You just met one another. And you may find that after four, uh, uh, after four times that you go to the church and you've had coffee together or tea, whatever your thing is, you're like, oh, this is my friend. So even if you're using the word friend, it is your associate who you know by church. You're associated because you go to the same church. And you are brothers and sisters in the faith. But it gets a little tricky because, again, 
you know people by their fruit. So you still have to test the spirit. It's always going to go back to testing the spirit. So these are some categories mentally for you to begin to really get clear. So think about the people in your life who you spend the most time with, what category would they fall into? And how does that help you to do number two, manage your expectations? So that's the second, the second thing we can do when you have friends who never show up for you. Number one, you gotta assess whether or not you've placed them in the wrong social category. You are considering someone, a friend, who's really more of an acquaintance, a coworker, or an associate that you know because you have a common association, whether it is the same hobby, the same church, uh, you're part of a parent mommy and me group or daddy and me group, and friendships can blossom from that, right? But you don't know that off the bat. This is what I'm getting at. Two, you have to manage your expectations. So once you get a sense of where people fall in your life because you've had enough experience, you're, you're looking for patterns, you're looking for characteristics, then second is manage your expectations. By expecting them to be whom they've shown you they are. One thing that I have learned to master is managing my expectations. I cannot tell you the last time that I have been disappointed by somebody's behavior or let down by somebody's behavior because I trust people to be who they are. I trust people to be who they are by looking for the fruit. So if you show me that you are a lemon of a friend, then I don't try to make you a peach of a friend. I am clear that this is what it is. And we are acquaintances. We are acquaintances but you're not gonna get my time and my energy in the same way that I would give someone who is my tried and true friend. I'm going to be cordial, just like you're gonna be cordial to your neighbors in your neighborhood, right? You look, you, you see your neighbor from across the way, you say, hey, good morning, Bob, good morning, so-and-so, but you're going about your, about your day. So managing your expectations by expecting people to be who they show you they are. Now, this is what Matthew 7, 16 says. Matthew 7, 16 says, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And so you know people by their fruit. But the problem is most individuals assess people by their own fruit. Just because you are loyal, kind, considerate does not mean that everybody who you associate with, who you're connected to, who you meet is going to be equally kind, uh, considerate, generous of spirit you don't know that you know them by their fruits so fruit is what we produce by way of our actions choices habits patterns and so you can see fruit when i look at a peach tree i can see the peaches on the tree so you will know them by their fruit so if someone shows you the fruit of gossip you have to assess is this going to be a good friend if someone shows you the fruit of speaking out of both sides of their mouth in front of the person, hey girl, how you doing? Oh, you look so great. And as soon as the person walks away, look at that trashy dress. She looks horrible. Da -da 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 -da. You, gotta, you gotta wonder, like that's not cool. They're showing you their character. They're showing you their fruit. They're showing you their actions. They're demonstrating. So I trust you to be a gossip if you were gossip. And because I trust you to be a gossip, I'm not going to tell you anything. And even if you think you know something, I'm not going to confirm it by having a conversation with you about it. So even if you bring it up to me, you talk into the air because you're not going to get an answer out of me. So you have to trust people to be who they are. If I know you a thief, I trust you to be a thief. I trust you to be a thief. So I'm not leaving my pocketbook around you. I'm not going to disappoint myself and set myself up for a letdown by inviting you into my home, leaving valuables out, and then saying, hey, I'll be back in two hours, make yourself at home. I'm not going to set myself up to succeed because I trust you to be who you are because we know people by their fruit. Now, people can change. I'm not saying they can't. People absolutely can change. But you can't make them change. Neither can I. They have to be willing to change. God doesn't even force us to change. God gives us free will and we get to choose life and blessings or death and curses. We get to choose whether we want to do life with God through Christ. These are choices, but he doesn't force us. 
So begin to manage your expectations, right? By expecting them to be who they've shown you. So the people who constantly disappoint you, who never invite you, who are they showing you they are to you? Even if they're kind to someone else, as it relates to their relationship with you, who are they showing you? Are they showing you they're narcissistic? Are they showing you that they're selfish? Are they showing you that they only come around when they need something? Who are they showing you to be as it relates to you? Are they showing you that they really don't rock with you like that because you constantly find out about the gatherings, uh, the get togethers by seeing pictures on Instagram. And when you ask them about it, they say, oh, you really should have been there. Oh, we meant to tell you. And it's been seven different instances. How many times can a person forget to tell you? They forget your birthday. You've been friends for 10 years. You remember their birthday. They don't have amnesia. <laughs> they can remember everybody else's birthday. They can even see you post, it's my birthday on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever you do. And there's no happy birthday from them. So who are they showing you? They're showing you that they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. And sometimes we want to tell ourselves beautiful lies instead of harsh truths. But the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth and the truth will set you free. So you will know them by their fruits, Matthew 7, 16. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So look at the analogy the scripture gives you. A lot of times people want a grape from a thorn bush and some of us have thorn bush friends or so-called friends and we trying to make them a grape. See, a grape will feed you. A grape is fruit. But a thorn bush will prick you. And so some of you have people who are pricking at your joy, pricking at your self-respect, pricking at the very fabric of your heart. And at some point, you got to make a different decision. And then it goes on to say, can you gather figs from thistles? Remember, fig is fruit, meaning you can eat it, right? But a thistle, those little flowers that look like cotton balls, the petals kind of look like cotton balls, they blow with the wind. So when you have friends who blow when times get hard, who blow when you need them, who blow during your moments of celebratory times. Maybe you started a business, you graduated from college, whatever those celebratory moments are, it's your birthday, whatever it is. And they, they, they're nowhere to be found. They blow in just like the, the petals on a thistle. So these are some things that you want to begin to ask yourself. Now, I want to tell you the purpose of friendship. Proverbs twenty seventeen, Proverbs chapter 20, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So this scripture right here shows you that relationships, particularly friendships, are supposed to be reciprocal, not transactional. There is a distinction. So as iron sharpens iron, look at the analogy. So the analogy is two iron blades sharpening one another, not one iron blade doing the heavy lifting and all the sharpening while the other one just sits there. Iron sharpens iron. So the, both iron blades are sharpening one another. So the analogy is just like two iron blades sharpen one another, uh, uh, a human being uh, sharpens the countenance of his friend. And so your countenance should be sharpened as a, as a result of this, of this friendship, meaning your mood, your mindset, your attitude. It will show on your face should be sharpened. And so if you are left drained, feeling bad about yourself, constantly feeling let down, feeling like you were the third wheel, feeling like you are an imposition, then this is not the right friendship fit for you. Right? Because is your countenance being sharpened? Or is it being dulled? Only you can answer that. So Proverbs 20, 17 lets us know that friendships are reciprocal. You are both supposed to be pouring into the friendship, pouring in care concern, respect, not just one person. Otherwise, you're doing the lion's share of the work. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10. Let me give you one more scripture that drives this point home. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them fall down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Why are two better than one according to this scripture? Because they have a good return for their labor. So this lets you know that you are supposed to get a return for your labor. If you are putting the labor, the emotional labor, the mental labor, the physical labor of showing up, but you're not getting a return on your labor, you're in a pitiful state. 
And so when we can tell ourselves these harsh truths, it allows us to be able to make clearer decisions from a place of clarity rather than a place of just emotions, a place of clarity. Like the, the truth of this relationship is that I'm doing all the heavy lifting. The truth of this relationship is that I have shown up for all their special moments. They've never shown up for mine. The truth of this relationship is, and you can really begin to make some decisions based on these scriptures and really thinking through the dynamics, the interactions of your friendships and the character of uh, people that you consider friends. So this is key. And I will tell you in my much younger years, in college years, college years like that, high school years, that I would be that friend who would constantly show up for people that would not show up for me. And so a lot of this also comes from our conditioning, how we have grown up. And I come from a very big family and uh, lots of aunts, lots of uncles, lots of extended family. And we are a family for the most part that moves as one. We are close knit. And so because of that, I would automatically, when I was younger, treat friends as family because that was all I knew. And so we would all go to my grandmother's house, all the cousins, and we had to share everything. And my grandmother grew up poor. She lived in public housing. And so when all the grandkids were at the house watching television, whatever one had, we all had to share it. And so it never occurred to me that you had people who were super selfish, who would just look out for themselves because I did not grow up like that. So even if you had a slice of pizza and you were my friend, we were gonna cut the pizza in half. If you didn't have money, I eat half the pizza, you eat half the pizza. If we got a drink, we gonna ask them, could we get a cup? <laughs> Maybe they make us pay 10 cents for the cup. Probably now it might be a dollar for the cup, I don't know. And uh, whatever we have, whether it's a soda or, or a Kool-Aid, whatever it is, we're going to pour some in the cup for you. We might have to get two straws if times are super hard. That's how I grew up. And so because of that, when I, I was a target, I was a target to be used because of the way that I grew up. And so we all have filtering systems or sometimes for some people it might be loneliness for some people, it might be seeking validation. The reasoning will be different. But the more that you can look back at your filtering system, how you were raised, what you went through, that will help you to begin to realize why you do some of the things you do. And I really had to learn to curb that aspect of my personality because I would be warm, welcoming. What's mine is yours. If Even uh, in my college years, when I would go to the, to the club, if you didn't have it, and I had it, we had it. But I had to start realizing that everybody don't move like that. Everybody don't move like that. And I had to pull back. I had to pull back. And so really begin to look at what are some of the things that drive your behavior. And so that leads to point number three. When so-called friends don't show up for your special moments and your times of need, and you've already assessed whether or not this is a friend, an associate, an acquaintance, because sometimes our expectations are not rooted in the reality of that relationship. Once somebody shows you they really don't care about you like that, you can't have expectations for them to care. Once somebody shows you that they're selfish, you can't have expectations that they're going to be generous. That got to come from the heart. They got to want to do that. Once somebody shows you the fruit that they're a little click and you are on the peripheral of that click, but you're not really on the inside fully of that click or that group, that's what it is. So when they don't show up for you for your special moments or times in need, consider whether you want to have a compassionate conversation or step back and let it go. So you got options depending on what you feel comfortable doing. Some people need to have a compassionate conversation and some people are like, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to step back and let it go. So you have to do what works for you. Be prayerful about it. Go to God. What should I do? Should I have a compassionate conversation or step back and let it go? And I use the word compassionate conversation so that 
if you are bringing up something that you want to bring to the surface to someone who you feel let down or disappointed by, we want to be mindful not to be attacking because anytime you corner a rat, and I'm not saying your friend is a rat, I'm just using this analogy, they're going to come out scratching, right? So anytime somebody feels cornered, they're going to come out fighting. And so a compassionate conversation is not like you are such a horrible friend. And you may really feel that way. You are such a horrible friend. But rather than saying you are such a horrible friend, be specific about the things that they did that show you they didn't show up for your special moments or their times or your times in need. So was it a situation where you uh, were in the hospital? They knew you were in the hospital because you called them to tell you to tell them you were in the hospital. You live in the same city and they never called you to check on you. They never came to visit you. Was it your birthday? Like, what was the specifics? So that's what I mean by a compassionate conversation. You are starting from a place of compassion rather than a place of attacking to get a better read on the situation. So that's one option that's available to you. Or you can just simply step back and let it be. Because sometimes we have already... We already have a read. We have enough information. We have enough experience to say, nah, this is what it is. You've shown me enough of your fruit. I've had enough thorns. I have enough thorny experience. I've been trying to get a grape out of you, but you keep pricking at my joy, pricking at my self-respect. And at this point, it's not even you. I'm pricking at my own joy and my own self-respect by allowing it, by continuing to show up for someone who refuses to show up for me. So I can't even put this on you. So we don't even need to have a conversation about it because I have to remove myself because this is not balanced. This is not reciprocal. This is not well-being. This is not helpful. This is not sharpening me. And this is not feeding any fruit. You just eating off of me, but, but we're not feeding each other, feeding care, kindness, consideration. So I'm going to just step back. So you got choices, right? Be prayerful about it and you will know what you need to do. So I hope that that's helpful for those of you who have been in that situation. And it is painful. As I said, in my younger years, I went through that quite often because of how I was uh, raised. And because of my, my family, like I said, we're a big family, we're close knit, we move as one. And so because of that, for the most part, for the most part, the majority, and because of that, I would automatically ascribe those characteristics to someone who I thought was a friend. And that's positive projection. And we do that a lot as human beings, right? Particularly, particularly believers, but as human beings in general, we may naively believe because we're kind we're considerate that the and we're uh, generous that the person who you're building a friendship with has those same qualities and you don't know that because we only know people by their fruit we don't know them by our fruit so with that being said i want to tell you about an event coming up on saturday october 12th is almost here our live event in new york city it is the fix your crown sis workshop this is a workshop where women are coming together to build one another up to be poured into for our goals, our purpose, our dreams, our betterment. If this sounds like an event you would like to be at, and you are a woman ages 18 and over, you can click on the link in the video description box and it will take you to the Eventbrite page where you can find more information. If you would like to dive deeper and really begin to have more tools for your well being, your mental fitness, your emotional resilience, your self-care become a member of the cassandra mac youtube channel at the wellness club tier that's going to give you access to our wednesday wellness group coaching calls they're therapeutic and as you hear me say it's cheaper than therapy so you're really getting a deal when you think about what therapy costs and the calls are therapeutic and they happen the first and third wednesday of every month we get on the phone by way of a coaching call and you're not just uh hearing me, but you're hearing the other members of the group share their experiences, share their thoughts, and it's really uplifting, encouraging to be part of our well-being community. And this is a place for like-minded, positive people. So if you're negative, we don't want you. Yes, I said it. But this is a place for like-minded, positive people who don't want to bring people down, who don't want to 
uh, see harm come to people, who don't want to be mean to people, but you want to encourage people and you want to be encouraged yourself. That's who we're seeking to be part of our Wednesday Wellness. So if that's you, check it out. Be part of the Wednesday Wellness Club. If you want a little more and you're a leader or an entrepreneur, then you may want to join the YouTube channel at the Winner's Circles tier. In the winner's circle, we have Zoom meetings, so we get to see each other on camera. So if you are camera shy, then I would encourage you to join the wellness tier. The winner's circle tier is not going to be for you because uh, we do Zoom meetings and uh, being on camera is uh, mandatory to be able to stay in the Zoom meeting. So if you know you're camera shy, then I would go on ahead and join the Wednesday wellness where you're not on camera. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're a leader, join the winner's circle once a month. We're on Zoom and we are talking about high level kingdom concepts for leadership, for success. So those are some of the additional resources that we have available. I always want you to know what we have for you beyond the video because sometimes the video is not enough. It's helpful for a moment, but you really may want something that's consistent and sustainable. And that's where the membership comes in, becoming a member. I also want to let you know about our latest book in the Simple Prayer series, and this is Simple Prayers for Your Finances, Simple Prayers for Financial Wisdom, Increase, and Overflow. And this book contains Bible-based prayers to really begin to develop biblical wisdom about what does the Bible say about managing money, about building wealth, and so forth. And uh, you will really find some awesome prayers. And this also makes a great gift, a great gift, a great Christmas gift. So with that being said, have an awesome day. Let's do our best to be kind to one another. Take care of yourselves and each other. I want to say a thank you to everyone who donates to this ministry. We could not do what we do without you. If you have been blessed from our ministry in any way, if our ministry has helped you in any way, consider giving a donation, whether you give a super thanks or whether you donate to the ministry by going to CassandraMacMinistries.com, clicking on the link that says give and giving a donation. Every bit helps. And when you donate, you are doing ministry with us. God bless you.